This is Duke University. So I start, thought I'd start, I thought part of my task is to kind of engage some of the myths that are out there in terms of religious freedom, church and state, and the colonial period. And uh, the first thing to bring up, I think, is this idea of a city on a hill, right? That uh, we see with Kennedy before he uh, takes the presidency in 1961, invoking this language of the city on the hill, he, uh, as he spoke to the Massachusetts uh, State House, uh, I have been guided by the standard John Winthrop set before his shipmates on the flagship Barbella 331 years ago, as they too faced the task of building a new government on a perilous frontier. We must always consider, he said, that we shall be a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. Today, the eyes of people are truly upon us, and our governments in every branch, at every level, national, state, and local, must be as a city upon a hill. And then he goes on to explain what he means by that. Uh, investing the idea of government with some sort of moral value, right, a social compact, and drawing on uh, this language that Winthrop used in his, not his sermon, but his talk, uh, on board the Arbella in 1631 uh, to make the case that America has a sacred task or social compact with the world. Of course, Reagan, uh, in his last speech to America before he left office, invoked this as well, saying, I've spoken of the shining city all of my political life, and how stands this center on this, win this city on this winter night? After 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true to the granite ridge, and her glow has held no matter what storm. He goes on to uh, sort of cast his work, what he views as his work for democracy uh, and freedom worldwide in light of that metaphor. So I wanted to kind of take on that metaphor first by talking about the Puritans and this idea of the, the city on the hill. Um, now first, let's define Puritanism. H.L. Uh, <laughs> Macon said uh, Puritanism is the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be having a good time. And I think that's one of the mythologies, not just Mankin, but um, other writers, particularly in the 19th century in New England, Hawthorne, for instance, that really sort of shape our understanding of the Puritans. I think it'd be helpful just to disambiguate um, two things very quickly, the difference between a Puritan and a separatist. I think probably most of you are familiar with this, but I think it's important for thinking about different approaches in the early years and may maybe uh, still speak to tensions that we have today in our approaches to religious freedom. So Puritans, uh, by and large, were those folks that this is uh, very simplistic. Uh, scholars would dispute that there was uh, a group known as the Puritans. But to make it simple, the Puritans, I think we can associate with Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, founded uh, in 1630 and uh, with the greater migration of 1633, um, having uh, the largest settlement in New England. Uh, we can think of the Puritans largely by their name as having the goal of purifying the Church of England from popery, or from human tradition, right? And some of these Puritans also had a, a wider social vision. So not just purifying the church, but also purifying society, right? Getting rid of the nominalism that they saw in the Church of England. And uh, so we think of Cromwell, of course, in the English Civil War in the 17th century in England, having that wider political social goal, right? Of purifying not only the church, but uh, in some sense, purifying the polity. And I think New Inc, New Inc, uh, Massachusetts Bay, rather, is founded with that vision. And the city on the hill, this model of Christian <laughs> charity that Winthrop puts forward, um, has that idea that the society itself will reflect this goal of modeling Christian charity, right? Showing love for one another, serving one another. And so that there's a, there's a social goal, not just the goal of purifying the church. On the other hand, you have separatists, those uh, that came out of the Scrooby Church in Lincolnshire in northern England, went to Holland and Leyden, and ended up in Plymouth in 1620 that we call the Pilgrims, right? And we associate with the first Thanksgiving and whatnot. Uh, I think the separatists, we have to be careful. I, and I would argue, actually, they did come for religious freedom, right? And their, their own. Uh, but they, and we'll see this with Roger Williams in Carrying on the Tradition, uh, don't care so much about others as long as they have their own. So they're not trying to affect a wider social mission as long as they have their own space. And <clears throat> so I think it's important to think of Plymouth and that separatist tradition as reflecting a different line of thought. They're not trying to necessarily build a commonwealth, to build a model of Christian charity. They want uh, a separate community that they can create a pure church, but not necessarily uh, enforce their will upon others. And, if that's not entirely clear, I'll pick that up in a second with Roger Williams. 
Now, this model, particularly in Massachusetts Bay, as you all know, or probably most of you know, quickly falls apart as they deal with various dissenters, most notably Roger Williams, who I mentioned, who's banished in 1637, and, and then uh, Anne Hutchison, who actually is not uh, banished until 1638. She's banished in 1638, uh, seven, and then leaves in 38. Um, yeah, and I need to correct this on Roger Williams, banished in 1635. <clears throat> now, to think about the Puritan approach to dissent or religious difference uh, in New England, uh, I'd like to quote Nathaniel Ward, who wrote, uh, The simpler, sim Simple Cobbler of Agawam in 1646. Agawam was uh, the modern Ipswich, Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, it's changed his name. Yeah. So he, he lived in Ipswich. Um, he said, He that is willing to tolerate any religion or discrepant way of religion besides his own, unless it be in matters merely indifferent, which is an important uh, qualification, either doubts his own or is not sincere in it. So this idea that toleration actually reflects your own doubt or insincerity or lack of commitment to your religious cause. On the other hand, we have men like Sebastian Castellio, who after Calvin uh, had executed the anti-Trinitarian Michael Servetus in Geneva in 1553, says, to kill a man is not to defend your doctrine, but it's simply to kill a man. So I would say that you have those competing traditions, but overall, Puritans are not that much different than other early modern uh, colonial societies who are seeking to uh, defend the commonwealth, the well-being of the whole, uh, over and against uh, descent, which is pictured as disease to the body politic. Now along comes Roger Williams, later Ann Hutchison, and they pose problems to this. And to summarize Roger Williams' main, the main problem that he poses, uh, he not only challenges the Puritans' right to be there in terms of their ownership of the land and, and, and indigenous ownership of the land, but he begins to advocate famously for soul liberty, right, or for freedom, freedom of the conscience. And famously in 1644, in his book, The Bloody Tenet of Persecution for Cause of Conscience, he said, an enforced uniformity of religion throughout a nation or civil state confounds the civil and religious. It denies the principles of Christianity and civility and that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And what he's talking about here, and I think the interesting thing with Roger Williams to highlight is he's actually, I would say, the ultimate Puritan. He's, he's a Puritan to the extreme, so much so that he wants the church to be absolutely pure. He not only refused to join the Boston Church, but later left the Plymouth Church, the Salem Church, set out to Rhode Island, founded, joined the Baptist Church, left that, had his own home church, increasingly uh, denied communion to the members of that church until it was just him and his wife. And then his wife wasn't good enough either, and so only he took communion, and then he just gave up. And this was his quest for a pure church. In that pursuit of a pure church, he believed that the state could only corrupt the pure church. And so his, and he begins using this language of a wall of separation to argue that God had placed a wall of separation to protect the garden of the church from the sword or from the power of the state. <clears throat> Anne Hutchinson, uh, I won't go into as much depth about her, but she presents a similar problem in terms of attacking the, the ruling, the, the sort of co-ruling of the magistrates and ministers in New England, and uh, is ultimately banished because of that challenge. I'd be happy to pick her up more uh, if we have time to talk about it. I want to mention uh, the Quakers, indigenous people, and the famous witches or, or uh, non-conforming uh, folks in Salem as other examples of dissent that quickly challenges this attempt to create a Puritan commonwealth in the 17th century. Uh, just to uh, cite quickly what happens to the Quakers, between 1658 and 1664, in those six years, Massachusetts Bay um, banished 22 Quakers on pain of death. Three had their right ear cut off. One was burned in the hand with the letter H, H for heretic. Uh, three had been ordered by the court to be sent to Barbados as slaves. 31 received 650 stripes, were whipped, administered with extreme cruelty, and over 1 million, I'm sorry, 1,044 pounds of property uh, were taken from the Quakers and four hanged, most famously Mary Dyer uh, there in the middle, commemorated uh, alongside Anne Hutchison at the Massachusetts uh, State House today. Uh, so let's just talk briefly about a couple other examples. That's the Puritans, that's New England. There are other examples of moderation. Uh, Pennsylvania, represented here by William Penn on the left. And then, I don't know if we can quite see this, uh, 
but these are maps of New York in the 18th century. And if you notice, uh, the top map has a picture of several congregations, including to the far right, uh, a synagogue. I'll talk about that uh, here in a second. And the bottom map actually lists these different congregations, including Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Dutch Reform, Lutherans, number 12, uh, the Jewish synagogue. Uh, and you have a, quite a bit of uh, toleration for diversity on the ground in New York, right? 16, the Quaker meeting house, and a Baptist meeting, Moravian meeting, um, all reflected, this is late 17th century and into the 18th century. Uh, Pennsylvania is another example of what I would call moderation in the middle colonies. Uh, William Penn in 1682, in his great law establishing the colony, uh, says, no person who shall confess and acknowledge one almighty God, and that professeth him or herself obliged in conscience to live peaceable under the civil government, shall in any case be molested or prejudiced for his or her conscientious persuasion or practice. Nor shall he or she at any time be compelled to frequent or maintain any religious worship place or ministry whatsoever. They think, well, he's pretty tolerant. He allows all sorts of diversity. But as long as you acknowledge one almighty God, so you have to be a theist. And if you want to take office, you have to be a Christian. You have to profess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Savior of the world. So more tolerant than Puritan New England, uh, not all the way there. Maryland, uh, 1649, famously passes the Act Concerning Religion. Uh, it's a different case in that Maryland, of course, is originally founded by George and Cecil Calvert, who are <coughs> recusant Catholics, who are seeking a place of protection for Catholic communities, who initially settle Maryland, but are quickly outnumbered by Anglicans and Puritans in the 17th century. And so help get a law passed in 1649 in the midst of the English Civil War uh, to protect themselves, actually, and their religious freedom over and against a growing, uh, sort of more virulent form of Puritan, uh, Puritanism and Anglicanism. Interestingly, in the Act Concerning Religion in 1649, it's most concerned with forbidding name calling. So we might consider this the first attempt to limit hate speech. Um, it, it lists all sorts of, you can't call anyone a Jesuit, you can't call anyone popish, you can't call anyone uh, a Puritan. Puritan is derogatory at this time. So it gives you a sense of what people were saying on the ground and how that was erupting in violence. And again, they guarantee freedom of religion as long as you believe in Jesus Christ and the Trinity. So they're most concerned with allowing Protestants and Catholics to get along, not uh, allowing others to come in. Now, the one interesting thing I want to uh, point out here is that as opposed to, and maybe very different than the European situ situation, American Catholics disproportionately supported the American Revolution, supported uh, changes in religious freedom, around the time of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and then certainly in the 19th century at the forefront of fighting for religious freedom, public school controversy in New York with Archbishop John Hughes. Uh, and so there's a long tradition of American Catholics very much embracing this idea of religious freedom. Uh, I would argue, and, and following more Jane Farrelly, uh, coming out of this experience in Maryland, where they had pretty expansive religious freedom in the 17th century, lost it after the Glorious Revolution in 1689, and found themselves fighting for it uh, later during the American Revolution. Okay, let me talk about one more uh, state, and then I'll wrap things up. Mm -hmm. Okay, the debate in Virginia. So I'm launching forward here to uh, the sort of revolution, post-revolution moment, to look at Virginia as a place where we first begin to get um, this di uh, formal process of disestablishment happening uh, constitutionally, well, uh, disestablishment at the state level, and I'm going to leave the constitutional federal issue for later discussion. So in Virginia, in the wake, during and in the wake of the American Revolution, you have several attempts to clarify what states should be doing in terms of establishing religion. It's the first real sort of uh, petri dish of, of debate and um, and contestation over what states can and cannot do in terms of establishment. So we have, for instance, Patrick Henry, Richard Henry Lee, arguing in their, in their um, idea for a moderate position that the state can tax and then distribute that tax to various teachers of the Christian religion. Uh, in this sense, they want to accommodate Baptists and Quakers and others. Uh, but you will give a tax, and then you would be allowed to distribute that money 
to your denomination, which they view as a very sort of enlightened um, accommodation. But Thomas Jefferson and James Madison famously say, no, 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 that's not enough. Uh, we need a bill for establishing religious freedom, later called the Statute for Establishing Religious Freedom. Uh, beginning in 1779, all the way till 1786, Jefferson fights for this alongside Madison, uh, and argues that God has given uh, people the freedom to reason. So he actually uses sort of a theological argument, uh, rather than the saying they're human rights, saying that the creator had endowed uh, humans with the freedom to reason, and he gave them that freedom to reason in order to choose. So the state uh, would be going against God to compel their consciences. Um, let me just make this final point. I know this was something that we wanted to comment on. Uh, well, one irony of this is that Jefferson allies himself with evangelical Christians, right, to make this case, particularly Baptists. And so the Southern Baptists, I think, today would find this ironic, right, that uh, their forebearers, particularly Isaac Bacchus, uh, were at the forefront of fighting for this religious freedom, just as Catholics. And Bacchus, who had fought um, against tyranny and for liberty during the Revolution, was frustrated and angry that uh, in Connecticut, Rhode Island, not Rhode Island, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, uh, the Congregational Church was still established after the Revolution, right? And he fought to disestablish the church. And Bacchus, along with particularly the Danbury uh, Association of Baptists in Connecticut, uh, solicited the support of Thomas Jefferson. And they joined cause to argue that this notion of separation of church and state, or the wall of separation as found in the Constitution, should be applied to the states. Uh, not just to Congress. I think I just said the phrase separation of church and state in the Constitution, which I didn't mean to say that. Uh, uh, of course, not in the Constitution, in Jefferson's letter to the Danbury um, uh, Association of Baptists. Okay, so here just a brief summary, and I'll stop here, of what happens after Virginia. Protestantism is still established in South Carolina until 1790. Some form of Christianity is established until 1810 in Maryland. The Congregational Church remains established in Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Massachusetts until 1833. So again, just to kind of get the details of what you said earlier, that uh, we need to demystify this idea that the Revolution and then the Constitution separated church and state, right? That it was a much longer process. In particular, over 50 years after the Revolution in Massachusetts, you still had an established church find Baptists like Isaac Bacchus uh, fighting for disestablishment. So I'll, I'll end there and then um, hopefully pick up any of these threads during conversation. Thank you. Uh, as with my uh, predecessor uh, on this program, I'm going to try to uh, compress a great deal of information into a relatively short period of time. And so that will necessitate that I uh, leave out a great deal of detail and gloss over some uh, uh, small conflicts and uh, speak or uh, uh, describe the picture with very broad brushstrokes. Um, but I hope to be able to concentrate in this presentation on Canada, uh, given that you've already heard about some of the uh, origins of religious institutions in the United, what became the United States in the colonial period. Uh, and uh, since many of you, I assume, who are listening are uh, uh, citizens or uh, natives of the United States, I thought that it would be helpful to talk in a little bit more detail, still in comparative perspective, but a little bit more detail about the history of Canada. Religion, as uh, Professor Bain made clear, uh, was integral to the founding of the United States. Uh, in contrast, a strict comparison reveals that fewer of the original settlers of Canada arrived on its shores as refugees from religious persecution. Strict comparison. Um, much is to be learned from comparative study. Uh, nor was Canada's formation, called Confederation, accomplished directly through invoking the Christian beliefs of the majority of its inhabitants. According to the Canadian church historian John Webster Grant, synods and conferences of the churches 
had virtually nothing to say about confederation. Anglican bishops largely ignored it in their charges. Its consummation was not marked by church services throughout the nation. More mundane factors held sway in the decision to consolidate the British possessions north of the border into a new political entity in 1867. For one, the United States in 1865 had concluded a horrible civil war and had embarked upon a path of sectional reconciliation. Leaders in Canada were fearful that a powerful neighbor, again united, could endanger the sovereignty of their fragmented territory. To knit together a scattered people and to attain greater solidarity from east to west across their fledgling nation, Canadian business and political elites planned grand projects of canal and railroad construction. For such transcontinental ambitions to be realized, they required new laws and governmental institutions, which came in the guise of confederation. Canada's founding act thus had more to do with rights of way than with the rights of man. <laughs> Promoters of railways and canals were among the leading entrepreneurs of confederation, records Grant. Rallying to repel territorial threats, Canada's political architects, the so-called fathers of confederation, had no time to remake their society according to a list of central philosophical or religious precepts, even were one available and accepted, and no warrant to do so either. Instead, their handiwork is marked by accommodations to and compromises with conditions that they found in place. And I'm going to uh, talk about some of these very, very quickly uh, as dimensions of contrast. Uh, some of these have already been alluded to both by Professor Moss and by <laughs> Professor Bain. Um, so I'm not really going to go into them in great detail. What I would like to do, however, is to concentrate most on this section dealing with <clears throat> beliefs since that's our subject today, religious um, freedom. Um, these conditions included a vast, is these conditions of, uh, of uh, starting, starting point in Canada, included a vast physical landscape covered with only a small population, the deep and enduring division of that population into Aboriginal, French-speaking, and English-speaking camps, the stubborn strength of local and regional identities as opposed to a truly national sentiment, and the unrelenting pull of a wider continental culture. All of these contingencies bred for Canadians a regular habit of negotiation and compromise rather than a commandment of conformity to a single national ideal. And this habit uh, is revealed, I would argue, in the church history of Canada. This person, uh, George Monroe Grant, uh, was about as important a public intellectual of 19th century Canada as you could imagine. Uh, he's associated in Canadian history uh, mostly with the history of Queen's University in, uh, in Ontario. I hesitate to say that among a group of McGill scholars. But uh, uh, Grant uh, gave a speech in 1874 that I want to quote from. Uh, and I'm not sure if you could read that. But I'm going to quote from it because I think it's very, very typical of attitudes held by public figures, both within the churches and within the broader society in Canada in the late 19th century. Uh, in this speech, Grant was uh, trying to envision what the future of Christianity would be in Canada uh, in the centuries to follow his own. Now, he didn't talk about Judaism or any uh, minority religion, but he did give a great deal of attention to Christianity. He said, God will give us the church of the future. It shall arise in the midst of us with no sound of hammer heard upon it comprehensive, 
of all the good and beauty that he has ever evolved in history. To this church, Episcopacy shall contribute her comely order, her faithful and loving conservatism, and Methodism impart her enthusiasm, her zeal for missions, and her ready adaptiveness to the needs of the country. The Baptist shall give his full testimony to the sacred rights of the individual, the Congregationalist his to the freedom and independency of the congregation, and Presbytery shall come in her massive, well-knit strength, holding high the word of God. And when, note this, and when, or even before all this comes to pass, that is, when we have proven our Christian charity, as well as our faithfulness, proved it by deeds, not words, who shall say that our Roman Catholic brethren also shall not see eye to eye with us and seal with their consent that true unity, the image of which they so fondly love. Why not? God can do greater things even than this. And who of us shall say, God forbid? Now that's a pretty expansive idea for its day of the idea of church unity. Now, to, to give you a little bit of a contrast, move ahead 50 years or so. This is Charles Clayton Morrison. He was an American. Uh, and uh, for much of his career, editor of the magazine The Christian Century, which is still published today. It's a leading organ of liberal Protestant opinion and reporting in the United States. Uh, Morrison uh, wrote a number of uh, books but I want to quote from one of them, which he published in 1948. And again, Morrison is not some fringe hate figure. He's about as mainstream a figure as you can find in the respectable quarters of American Protestantism of 60 or 70 years ago. I'm not going to read this whole thing, because it's rather long. But um, the last paragraph. This is from a book of his called Can Protestantism Win America, published in 1948. Protestantism can never have ecclesiastical fellowship with a church which maintains itself as a system of irresponsible power derived from the abject submission of its members. It is such a system which is the essence of Roman Catholicism. It falsifies Christianity is an affront to human dignity, is incompatible with both the spirit and the institutions of democracy, and contains within itself the ineradicable seeds of its own corruption. No such irresponsible power is safe in any human hands. It, it goes on, but, but uh, I think you can, get the, you can get the flavor pretty distinctly from that. Um, the nice thing about the Canadian approach is that it blunts and has historically blunted some of the potential for absolutism in thought and the acute conflict in behavior that, uh, uh, find my place, just a moment, oh, uh, that it can trigger. The necessity of continuous compromise in the interests of religion regionalism and race, wrote the Canadian economic historian Harold Innes, explains the paucity of political thinking and the importance of pretense in mediocrity to political leaders. The contemporary literary critic Noah Richler has implied much the same thing about his own country, though in more intimate terms. Richler says, we are a nation founded on uncertainty and doubt and querulous and wonderfully modern as a consequence. Many who participated in or supported the process of Canada's creation were descended from persons who specifically rejected the revolution to their south, or in the case of Quebec, who predated the one in their original mother country, and who remained loyal to the idea of state-sponsored religion. Harold Innes again stated this fact tersely when he remarked, 
a counter-revolutionary tradition implies an emphasis on ecclesiasticism. The political scientist Seymour Martin Lipset put the identical matter in comparative terms when he asserted the United States has been a sectarian country, Canada has been a church country. And there you can see a few visual examples, I think, of that tendency. Uh, if you look through, uh, if you go to the Canadian uh, the Libraries and Archives Canada uh, photographic collections, you'll find numerous pictures of really large and ornate church buildings constructed in what most Canadians would consider to be the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and there's an example there with a, uh, a Ukrainian church in the middle of an, of an otherwise entirely unsettled prairie in, uh, in Alberta. Uh, a Moravian church, this is in Labrador on the right. Uh, again, a, a, a huge building and not much else around it. Whereas in the American example, you can see the sort of sectarian influence <laughs> a lot more dramatically. This is an old gas station that a, a congregation uh, has taken over and used <coughs> as its church. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's, uh, uh, the, the pumps have been decorated with pictures of Jesus and uh, inviting souls to fill up with the Holy Ghost. That's, that's not a very uh, Canadian sort of picture. Um, the aftermath of the two nations having followed diverging paths in religious organization is visible even today statistically in the relative concentration of Canadian Christians in a handful of large nationwide denominations. But the dispersion of their American brethren throughout a much more extensive and varied collection of religious bodies. And again, you can see this. These statistics are a little bit old. This is from 2008. And this is the United States, the proportion of the adult population in each of these uh, religious uh, affiliations. This is from the Pew Forum, an organization that does frequent survey research on religion in America. Um, by my calculation, if you look at the top four American uh, religious affiliations, they take in only about 53% of the respondents. But if you look at comparable data, these are from the 2001 Canadian census. Canada, unlike the United States, and this is something I think the public policy people might uh, explore, Canada, unlike the United States, does, asks a question on its uh, census uh, pertaining to religious affiliation. The United States does not and periodically has had major political uh, battles over whether to include such a question. But this is the, these are the Canadian data. And again, you see there are really three large actors in the religious field. The Roman Catholic Church, which to this day uh, claims about, nominally anyway, about 80% of the population of Quebec, although with respect to practice, there's a very different picture. Um, no religion, which is a growing category. Uh, the United Church of Canada, which was the product of a Protestant merger, which I'll refer to in a minute, and the Anglican Church of Canada. Again, if you look at the top four affiliations, including the no religion, uh, that accounts for more than three quarters of the population. As of uh, 2000, 2001 data published in 2003. Um, Sorry, you said that no religion accounts for three quarters? It, no, no. no, it's uh, no religion is about seven, 16 oh, okay. percent. The top three, I got you. Right. But if you take the top four, you get about three three quarters of the uh, of the total um, uh, population. Um, in 1791, the act that established two Canadian provinces, Upper Canada, where today one finds Ontario, and Lower Canada or Quebec, also allocated the proceeds from one seventh 
of all public or crown lands to pay for the Protestant clergy. The law intended that Protestant mean the Church of England, but ministers of other Christian denominations later challenged this interpretation and sought portions of state funds for themselves. Partly to quell the rising conflict, the bulk of these monies was shifted in 1854 to a public fund that would underwrite the expenses of schools. Edgerton Ryerson, the Methodist leader who attacked publicly paid for clergy, concluded that although religion is essential to the welfare and even the existence of civil government, the state is not the divinely appointed instructor of the people. It would seem that Christians in 19th century Canada had advanced far toward their goal of forging a godly nation when they took part of a verse from the Psalms as the country's official motto, amare usque ad mare, Latin for from sea unto sea. However, their dream eventually foundered on the sharp seams of their nation's own internal cleavages. Because these differences persisted against the backdrop of religious establishment, formal at first and then informal, the rampant type of pluralism that caused Christianity to grow and expand in the United States held the churches in check in Canada. For an American perspective, from an American perspective, denominational variety could be a good thing, wrote David Schaff, an uh, American historian, one century ago. Differentiation in the church today may be as positive an indication of vigor, of religious thought and conviction, as differentiation in the vegetable world is an indication of the inner fullness of life. For Canadians, however, rivalry among the churches was taken as a sign of the fragility and thus the vulnerability of institutional religion. Instead of competing against one another head to head, to gain material resources, to open new fields of endeavor, to add further members, Canadian Christians learned early the virtues of cooperation and church comedy. Christianizing an immense territory shortly to be populated by millions of people of foreign birth, ideals, and traditions, predicted Canadian churchman S.D. Chong, could not be accomplished with reasonable speed by competing churches duplicating their resources upon a single task. And so the cooperative ethic sometimes entailed, for the sake of efficiency, a clear demarcation of tasks and terrain. In Alberta, for example, Presbyterians limited themselves to work among people contiguous to the lines of the Canadian Pacific Railroad while the Methodists served those along the tracks of the Canadian National Railway. At other times, it surpassed simple sharing and stimulated actual mergers of church bodies. Between 1874 and 1884, six groups of Canadian Methodists became one. Four Presbyterian groups combined in 1875, and by 1893, all of the dioceses of the Church of England in Canada were unified under a sole structure. All of this activity was a mere prelude, though, to the sweeping action in 1925 that created the United Church of Canada out of a union of the Methodist, Congregationalist, and most Presbyterian churches. Such a thorough breaching of historical denominational lines, it has been said, had never taken place within the old Christendom. The resulting combinations, in the words of the same commentator, is as Canadian as ice hockey. Uh, to move up a little bit in history, but to avoid talking too much about the Constitution, which is something that others will cover, from its very beginnings, a country committed to or captive of is essential plurality. Canada became, by the 1960s, to enshrine in federal law bilingualism, the equality of its two principal languages, English and French. And in 1971, it instituted an official policy of multiculturalism. Canada's constitution, 
repatriated from Great Britain in 1982, included a landmark charter of rights and freedoms that protects freedom of conscience and religion in section two, as well as provisions banning religious discrimination in section 15, and instructing that the document itself be interpreted in a manner in keeping with the nation's multicultural reality, section 27. But Canadian legislation dealing with cultural diversity is not simply defensive. The federal government in Canada, through several granting agencies, provides financial subsidies to organizations that help immigrants actively to retain and develop their cultures in North America. Finally, the Multiculturalism Act of 1988 identifies Canada as a polity dedicated to the promotion and incorporation of cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, and somewhat less explicitly, explicitly religious pluralism. One concomitant of these changes in Canada was an explosion of official evidence of that pluralism. In fact, between 1971 and 1981, Canada's census, which as I said, unlike the census of the United States, collects data on the religious preferences of individuals, could be read to indicate increases of at least fourfold in the numbers of Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs in the population. So to conclude my contribution, the United States copes with such rampant religious diversity by folding it unobtrusively into smooth layers of patriotic ideology. There you see an example of some of this mixing with President Richard Nixon in 1970 paying a visit to uh, one of the famous crusades of the evangelical evangelist, Billy Graham. All those people you see in the stands, this is in Tennessee, turned out to see Graham, not necessarily <laughs> Nixon at that point. Um, and you can see also some of the rhetoric that goes with that kind of mixing of religion and politics. The top quotation is from Billy Graham himself, uh, where he says in one of his radio speeches, this is from the 1950s, from 1955, can anyone explain the miracle of America without mentioning the power, the guidance, and the grace of God? God is so inseparably woven into the warp and woof of our national fabric by history, tradition, and fact that he cannot be removed without destroying the whole. If you would be a true patriot, then become a Christian. If you would be a loyal American, then become a loyal Christian. If you would be a devout parent, then become a devout Christian. If you would be a good neighbor, then become a good Christian. This is basic and fundamental to American salvation. And this bleeds over into uh, politics. The lower uh, panel has a quotation from Dwight Eisenhower in which he said, without God, there could be no American form of government nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. Thus the founding fathers saw it, and thus, with God's help, it will continue to be. Canada's institutions are ill-equipped for, and so resist, such maneuvers of identity. This difference, however, may have its advantage. Uh, the quotation above is from the Canadian news magazine, Maclean's. Somehow Canada has largely dodged tabloid politics. Much more of the personal remains apolitical. Who sleeps with whom and who worships what? And then you see a, a political cartoon uh, uh, elevating the importance of hockey over traditional marriage. At that point, I think I should conclude. slide back in and, and we, we all we can we'll take a few minutes for discussion and, and questions uh, from the audience. Yes, Andrew, Sorry. Ambassador Bennett. Andrew's right. I think you have to say excellency. No, Your excellency, <laughs> Your Majesty. No, no, no.
<laughs> well, that's, I think that's the that's formal just, that's right. okay. address. Yeah. I was just paying for my trip. Oh, well, that's okay, good. thank you. Sure. Um, so I wanted to just ask, um, both very good presentations, and I think uh, captured a, a real distinction between, between our two countries. But I wanted to ask uh, Professor Cristiano just one point. And you said, obviously, that you had to gloss over a lot of different things. But I wanted you to situate, I mean, I liked your George Monroe Grant quotation. I'm a big fan of him and his, uh, his progeny, uh, George Grant. Um, and I wanted to get your sense, where do you situate um, in your argument, um, what was also the mainstream in Canadian uh, political, religious life, socio-religious life, um, the Loyal Orange Lodge in Ontario, which was a dominant force. It was certainly the mainstream. Uh, you could not be mayor of Toronto unless you were a member of the Orange Order. That was abruptly changed when a, a Jewish uh, mayor, Nathan Phillips, became mayor in the 19, uh, late 1950s. I remember, actually, growing up in Toronto, uh, my mum and my uh, aunts and uncles taking me to uh, St. Patrick's Day Mass at St. Michael's Cathedral. Um, and this was in 1988, and it was the first time that a St. Patrick's Day parade was held in Toronto since the mid-1950s when it broke into a riot with the Orange Order. Um, and then on the Quebec side, where do you situate uh, Lionel Grou and Jules Paul Tardivelle and the Ultramontanes, who were also very much the mainstream um, and certainly did not have as expansive an understanding of ecumenical dialogue as uh, George Monroe Grant would like us to believe. I, I, I think that's true. What, what Ambassador Bennett is referring to are uh, examples of obvious uh, historical episodes of religious intolerance in Canada. Uh, the Orange Order was a militant Protestant organization uh, in much of English-speaking Canada, especially in Ontario. Uh, militantly opposed to the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, and uh, on the Quebec side, the persons to whom he's referring uh, were militantly anti-Protestant. They were, in effect, analogous figures uh, representing formal Catholicism. Um, so I don't mean to diminish those conflicts. Uh, and it may be that uh, the contrast that I gave you between uh, Grant and Morrison is a little bit overdrawn. Um, and it was a case of having to paint with very broad brushes. Uh, there, there has been a lot of evidence of uh, interdenominational or interreligious conflict in Canada as well. But I think by, by American standards, it's still somewhat uh, moderated or modulated. Um, uh, if, you, if, if we go back to the history of anti-Catholicism in America, for example, you actually had cases of, 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 of deadly riots and murders and uh, 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 a bloody history. Uh, we were talking before about Professor Bain's research. Well, there's a bloody history of that uh, in the United States, which is not quite as vividly replicated in the case of Canada. But, but Ambassador Bennett is correct. There, there are clearly examples in Canada of uh, lack of tolerance, lack of understanding, and lack of accommodation. Uh, but, but much of that uh, uh, obviously does not describe fully the, the, the situation now. You have to go a little bit farther back in history to see that. But, um, but there, are, there are lingering elements of that. Uh, uh, Lionel Gruel, who you mentioned, who was a, a, a Catholic priest and a leader of nationalist and religiously uh, orthodox thinking in the Catholic Church in Quebec, is still, is still regarded today by, uh, by many Quebecers as an important figure uh, and a reputable figure. Uh, and by others. <laughs> well, by, <laughs> by others as, as a kind of bigot. <laughs> But um, uh, uh, you know they name they name things after Lionel Gruel in, in Quebec. They used to have a metro station named after him. I think they just changed the name though. Um, it's, still it's still there. Oh, yes. It's still there. Oh, I thought they were going to change the name. Uh, but there are examples of of that in Quebec, and it, it would be. I don't know what the equivalent would be in the United States. You'd have to have. Uh, 
you know, the Bull Connor Elementary School or something like that. Um, that may be too vivid an example, but uh, uh, there is a kind of uh, pride of place and pride of, of peoplehood in Quebec that often is not, in my opinion, adequately discriminating in, in judging pieces of the past. Uh, uh, and so uh, Ambassador Bennett is certainly correct about that and, and correct about the Ontario example as well. So something that I've uh, studied a little bit is the difference in religious um, levels of religious practice uh, in the United, uh, differences in between the United States and Britain. Um, and it seems to me that that difference has at least something to do with the different approaches to religious freedom and the different paths of religious freedom that were taken in those <coughs> countries. And I wonder, I don't, I, know, I don't know as much about the, over, first of all, the overall levels of religious practice in Canada and how they compare to those in the United States. But also I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how the kind of paths of secularization or non-secularization that have been taken in the United States and Canada depend on those um, histories of religious freedom. Well, I'll just say briefly that uh, there's a long history of uh, both participants in the process of disestablishment as well as uh, foreign observers believing that disestablishment promoted uh, religious growth in America, right? And so Madison, this is part of his argument in the Memorial and Re Remonstrance, is that actually this will promote religion, right, if we disestablish. And then, of course, uh, de Tocqueville, and then later Philip Schaff, and others when they come in the 19th century say this is what, this is why religion is so vibrant in America, right, because it has been disestablished and it's allowed uh, growth. Um, and I, I think it gets to maybe part of what you signaled in some of your pictures and argument of the difference between sort of institutional churches and sectarian, right? And it's in that um, early 19th century, a little bit late 18th century, that sectarian groups um, expand rapidly during the Second Great Awakening, right? And take advantage of this new moment, both geographically but also legally, to uh, work on the frontiers, work in the South, work amongst minorities. Um, and um, particularly the Baptists and Methodists originally, but Pentecostals more so in the 20th century, uh, grow rapidly in that context of disestablishment. I, I'm, just to add one thought to that, um, uh, when you talk about secularization in the Canadian context, you really have to separate out Quebec, which is kind of a special case. And there you see the evidence of uh, religious uh, declension, very, very stark and very, very uh, obvious. And in a relatively short time, in the space of about 50 years, what had been a fairly um, uh, homogeneous and solidary <laughs> Catholic culture has unraveled. And that hasn't happened to Catholics elsewhere in Canada and it hasn't happened to other Christians elsewhere in Canada, at least not to the same degree. Um, so Quebec is really a special case, and there are other arguments about that case historically and sociologically, which um, I won't go into for, for lack of time, but we could talk about that. Uh, one more question, and then I'm going to jump in and then stop it. Okay. Go ahead. My prerogative is moderator. Um, so thank you both for your presentations. I uh, am, this might be a large question, but um, I'm interested in the fact that these contexts that we're talking about are settler colonies. And I know Professor Bain, your previous work has dealt with indigenous communities. And I'm curious, um, because in the way in which that we're <clears throat> defining religion, it seems that it's, uh, it, reproduce it, well, I don't want to be this political about it, but I'm just curious about um, what gets defined and what doesn't get defined as religion in this historical moment. Because if you think of indigenous communities, yeah. they become enclave because they're, un the understanding is that either they don't have a religion or that their way of life needs to be, it's cannot be commensurate with the settlers that are coming from mm -hmm. Europe. So I'm just curious um, if we could talk about that and maybe I think the spatial politics of this are interesting in relation to what um, Professor Cristiano, you were talking about with 
the differences between the US and Canada in not just rights of ways versus rights of man, but also in uh, the ways in which these institutions are spatialized with churches being in these uh, no man's lands versus being very politically public mm -hmm. uh, in the Americas. Well, Native there's uh, so much there. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to, um, so I couldn't agree with you more. Um, mm. In the colonial period, one thing I would have given time, I probably would have highlighted were some of the differences between the Spanish approach and their attempt to incorporate indigenous communities and make them a part at the same time accommodating in some sense, having the Republica de los Indios, having different sorts of laws and protections um, passed large, first at the instigation of Dominicans and people like Bartolome de las Casas, um, but later in the context of colonial experience. And that the real sort of, sort of stark contrast, I started and I was able to do this because I worked under David Hall studying Puritans at Harvard, but then changed to studying the Spanish context. So I'm very sensitive to the real differences, particularly in how they work with indigenous communities in the colonial uh, situation. And the, what's really surprising when you look at them side by side is that despite, and I was going to put the Massachusetts seal that has famously has an Indian on it saying, come over and help us, despite that uh, supposed motivation for why, why they settled Massachusetts, they really don't do anything at a systematic level to try to um, accomplish that help, right? Other than John Elliott, who's a pastor in his free time. In Newton, Massachusetts. Boy, well, God. Roxbury, he, yeah. he, he was in Roxbury, right. but he spent time yeah. uh, setting up the praying towns and writing the Massachusetts Bible. Um, but it was very sort of informal, whereas the Spanish attempt is sort of a conscious attempt to create a whole society Despite all of the problems uh, that that engendered, I think it's uh, kind of worth meditating on that initial uh, impulse in, in the, the English and then American experience to push out to, by taking land and or incorporate through total conversion, but not setting up accommodations or setting up sort of different communities. And I'm just going to jump in and say, and it, at least in the, in the, the the, the French colonial context. Uh, I invite you to read the Jesuit relations, all what 70 whatever volumes, but I mean it's very instructive of the attitude towards native peoples and how they um, sent out mission uh, missionaries and, and, and tried to deal with them, which then of course in a way leads right to the Indian schools, which we had in both countries. But um, I, I want to just quickly throw in something um, because in the, um, it, um, Malachi mentioned that we've done a, a couple other events here, and one, and, um, one of our uh, actually repeat guests has been uh, Morton Weinfeld uh, from McGill University, who um, is uh, one of the leading experts about uh, Jews in Canada. And uh, he, the first time he came here, he gave a very interesting talk in where he compared sort of um, the secularization of American Jews with the Hasidic community, the ultra-Orthodox being the exception, versus Canada, where they tend to be more religious. There are more conservatives, there are more Jews who've been to Israel. Um, and, uh, and he sort of implied that it was attributed not only to the sort of in-betweenness of the Jews, sort of caught between the Catholics and the Protestants, which sort of kept them in between, but also the multicultural policies that, that have been referred to, which encourages, you know, we have this melting pot assimilationist model in the United States, but they never did. So, um, but, it, but it really, I think, it goes to your, um, the question of the, um, you know, sort of religious practice um, and, um, and, and maintenance of it. Okay, I'm gonna actually use my, my right as, as, as moderator to, I know, to, to, to stop this now and, and, and assume that, uh, can we take five minutes? We'll be running a little bit late, but that's okay. Take five minutes if you want to get something to drink or, or make a stop at the, the restrooms or, or washrooms for you Canadians, right? Um, all right, down the hall and on the left. Okay, we'll be back in, uh, can we say five minutes?